Hi, I'm Josh Bassiches, Director and CEO of the Royal Ontario Museum. Welcome to this special online presentation of our signature lecture series, Rom Speaks. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation since time immemorial to today. From fascinating viewpoints to thought-provoking insights, Rom Speaks presents the brightest minds and most compelling voices on ideas that matter across art, culture, and nature. Please enjoy this essential new addition to our Rom at Home digital programming. And I look forward to welcoming you back to the museum for more programs like this when it is safe to do so. Let's get started. You've been on tour. Uh, you haven't been able to see this exhibition until this afternoon. Um, how were the fans in Moscow, actually, I should ask you first off? <laughs> I was in Moscow yesterday. I, I know it's hard, to, hard, to, uh, hard for me to comprehend. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I just saw, I just seen the collection for the first time today, this afternoon upstairs and it, it looks phenomenal. Uh, I missed my collection when I saw it. I, it felt like I was seeing a pet that I hadn't seen in like six months. Uh, but uh, it's, it, it's great to see it uh, in a different context. Uh, it's always um, a thrill for me to, 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 to see other people enjoy it as much as I do, and yeah, I'm I'm just really super excited about about the 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 whole show and the ex exhibition in general. So you've been collecting your whole adult life, and you've loved these things individually, and you've arranged them into groups that happen to please you. But now you see them in a museum where there's at least a quasi-didactic structure where people rationalize, they see groupings, they understand a lot of what Josh was talking about, some of the motivations behind creating them. That's different than what you did. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I, 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 that's another uh, thing that's really interesting is, is how they're being displayed upstairs. Uh, there's w one particular aspect uh, uh, of, of how uh, it enfolds, which is really, really great. How it's all, all, uh, all uh, arranged so that every time you, you turn a corner, there's just something else that, that just hits you with a lot of impact, and it's uh, it, it was a lot of fun for me to see that. And uh, there's a, a, at one point I, I was looking at at how everything was displayed, and I looked at a certain angle, and 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 from that angle I could see three floating Frankenstein heads. And it was just really amazing. Um, and you can only see it from, if you're like 30 feet away, and you see the three posters. And the, the way that they're just kind of angled, it's just it's just really great to see. Uh, it's almost poetic to me. I, I, I can understand I that. I uh, crazy. The graphics are so powerful and strong to think you know what you're looking at or to see them in reproductions is not the same as seeing these uh, original works in the scale that they hold and some of the beautiful printing and the lithography. Um, you clearly have an appreciation for the people who created these posters as artists. Now, they were work for hire. They are anonymous for the most part. They were prevented from signing their posters and um, they created some amazing things that show fantastic creativity and, and emotional expression. Um, you, as an artist yourself, who does get great acclaim, I mean, how do you think about these people? Do you think they uh, enjoyed their work? Do you think they were frustrated? Um, we don't really don't know, so I, I assume that you have to envision this. Well, well I mean, when I see these posters, uh, and particularly the ones from, from the early 30s, the, there are there are artists that 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 that, uh, that you can see have done numerous posters, and I'm always struck by just how much commitment they put into it. I mean, it showed that they, they really wanted to convey emotion, and they really took the time to do that. I mean, it's really amazing. And you know, it's it's interesting. You know, 
when you, you said uh, how, how these artists were uh, anonymous, I mean, one day someone should, should erect a, a, a monument to the anonymous artist. <laughs> Just like the, 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 the Arc de Triomphe is a tribute to the, you know, the unknown soldier. There should be a monument to, to the, un, the anonymous artist, you know? That's fabulous. I, I, I think someone will get on that if they haven't already. <laughs> it's just an interesting kind of thing. Well, I, I think you've pointed out to me uh, in many places where you can see the same hand at work across different, um, even uh, across different films. Yeah. You know that there's somebody there who was core to the whole process, but whose name we'll never really know. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's a shame, too, because, uh, yeah. I'm curious to see if they moved on to other fields, you know, other 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 fields of illustration or whatnot. And I mean, who knows? I mean, there's absolutely no information. So, not for lack of looking, people have looked, and it's just these archives just just don't exist. So, you've told me about one poster in particular, which I think, if I push the green button, will magically appear. There we are. Um, one of your personal favorites. Why don't you just tell us about it? Talk us through this poster. What do you like about it? Well, I, it's, well, for one, it's just like, it's so visually striking. I mean, the colors just leap out. When I first saw that, that poster, and I had never seen it before because it was a poster that had not been printed yet, and this was like in the early 80s when I first saw that poster. I was just amazed at how, how I couldn't look away. I mean, it, it, the, the imagery of, of Boris Karloff in, 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 in livid color as the mummy was striking to me because that, that image in my mind was always black and white. And so to see it in full color like that, it was mesmerizing. And then to see uh, 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 Zita Johan uh, uh, kind of like draped over that that uh, uh, what looks like a tombstone, and and, and just like the glamour and the elegance of, of, of how she's situated, I, it, it's 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 almost a, a, a you know a, a kind of like yin and yang sort of like uh, uh, a presentation, uh, um, and, and you know the, the just the, the, I can. There's just so much to this poster that that just struck me that uh, that I just thought to myself, "Wow! I mean, you know, I have to see more of these." And it it, it just really got me on my uh, my journey to just find these posters or just to find pictures of these posters, just to see what they look like and to see these 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 characters in color, illustrated in color. Because in my mind, up to that point, they're always in black and white. I think you told, you pointed out that the fact that his, uh, the mummy is green was real. That he turns up in the movie cards as green, but that the film, of course, was black and white because... Yeah, that, that, uh, the, because green on, on black and white film uh, shot at, uh, as, as pale white. And you know, I don't know the, the, the mechanics of that, but um, a lot of the of uh, the, the 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 characters, like Frankenstein's monster, was also green because on black and white film it would read as pale white, and so a lot of the lobby cards, a lot of the posters were were designed by the illustrators who were on set, so. No one told them that the reason why these creatures were, or these characters were green was because of, because of they were being filmed. So they just, they, they, they illustrated them as they saw them. And so that's why Karloff is green in this poster. And that is why I reached to the back of my closet the other day and I pulled out this shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really pleased to see you got some in your own shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> green, hey. Green's a great color. But you also pointed out to me once, I, my perspective on this poster shifted. I've always loved the movie, and I've always thought about it as a timepiece, which is about ancient Egyptian archaeology. Um, but that figure of the woman is Art Deco. It is yeah, a classic absolutely. 1930s look. And so the ancient and modern go hand in hand. Yeah. That, yes. was, a, that was a fascinating insight to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 
it's interesting too, it comes to life. I mean, this poster literally, and when I see it, it comes to life in my mind. And that, that tagline, you know, it, it's really suggestive. Um, there's so much, there's, to me, the, the way the, the, this, this uh, poster is illustrated, there, I, I get you know, a feeling of romance, I get a feeling of like, uh, uh, elegance, you know, I get a, a feeling of, 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 uh, of like, uh, other things other than, you know, than horror or being, being afraid or, 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 or scared or whatever. And you know, I, I, a lot of the posters from the 30s are, are kind of designed in that fashion too. And I think the, the reason for that is because in the 20s and 30s, romantic films were the, the most popular type of film. And so to reel in that, that type of audience, these posters were illustrated with an element of, of romance uh, uh, or a subplot. Of, they're written with a subplot of romance. And that's why you know you would always see couples or you know the monster chasing a woman or whatever i mean it was because of the, that that whole angle is just very very popular at the time yeah the mummy was quite a romantic character it wasn't his fault yeah. it wasn't his yeah. fault he was turned into a mummy yeah. right yeah and, and frankenstein's monster but the most romantic character was dracula yeah. Yeah. and i truly believe that we'll get there in a minute yeah, yeah right so your collections is, as I view it, sort of falls into three categories. You've got posters, and you've got film props, and you've got toys. So in what order did you start to collect these things? Did you get jazzed by them all? Well, you know, I mean, truly, I, I, I collected comic books uh, as, a, as a kid and monster magazines as a kid, and I started collecting that stuff when I was six years old, six, seven years old, and collected all throughout my childhood. And uh, I, I discovered music around 12, 13 years old, and I discovered guitar when I was 15 years old. And all my collecting kind of like fell to the wayside because I was busy collecting riffs and chords and scales and all that sort of stuff. But that, that, that collecting bug was always in the back of my mind, kind of just percolating, you know, it's just kind of like on pause. And then later on, when I, I, you know, when the band started getting more successful, I jumped right back into it because uh, the, uh, it, it was just always there and just always kind of reminding me that you know, I still had that fascination and, and still had that kind of, of need to, to just fill my, 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 my life with this kind of stuff, and I just jumped in head first. With all three categories then? Um, well, yeah, to answer your question, I started off with comics and magazines, and then as I got back into it, I started uh, uh, buying a lot of, uh, of the more rare 1960s monster toys, and then I got into, the, into more of the artwork, and then I bought a movie poster, and I put it up on the wall, and I thought, wow, that's just great. And it wasn't really you know, a particularly rare or special movie poster. It was a, a poster that I really, really enjoyed. It was the Gorgon from, uh, 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 from, uh, uh, yeah, from 1965 or something, a Hammer film. And I just thought it was a great striking image. And then I, got, I had an opportunity to buy, to, uh, buy a Bride of Frankenstein half sheet. And when I bought that, all of a sudden, I just, I remember taking it out, 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 of, the, uh, out of the package that was, uh, was mailed to me and just looking at it and going, wow, this is an incredible relic from that time, from the year that that movie was made. And it's, it's beautiful. And what, what does this all mean? <laughs> well, you jumped in to the deep end with deep, that deep, yeah, yeah, head first, yeah. all the way, you know, it's just like, where do I sign? <laughs> Once you buy a Bride I mean, of Frankenstein, there's no turning back. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I was intrigued from that moment and, you know, very, very excited and, and I put it up and, you know, I just stared at it for years. So, so of the toys, I know a, a lot of the Toys were rare even in their day. Some of them, people say, oh yeah, I remember one of those, but to a large extent, these were specialized things. Do you, 
have a favorite toy today? I mean, I, I think it's probably not fair to ask you what was the first one you collected because mm. you were well. Yeah, I really like the the Aurora Monster models because they 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 really were iconic uh, for me because when I was a, a, a kid, I would buy those models, I would put them together, I'd paint them, I'd, I'd put all this time and care into making sure that they're really, really great, and then I'd blow them up with firecrackers or set them <laughs> on fire, or throw them off the roof, or, you know, just like, <laughs> I, damn. And today they're worth, well, for, for like years I did this. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. that, and then that, people ask me, do you have any of that stuff from, yeah. as you're a child? I was like, no, are you kidding me? I destroyed all of it. <laughs> you had to start all over again. Yeah, it was, and I like to start all over again. It's a fun thing to do. So the show includes a poster and some original art and a segment of the first horror film you ever saw, which, of course, you, you know, like many kids, you watch this stuff and you're scared, but at some point in time, you realize, hey, this is actually pretty funny, right? Yeah. So what is it in your mind about the relationship what is it about horror and about comedy? What horror and, and comedy? Oh, comedy. What? Well, I mean, some of the greatest horror films out there are, 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 are films that really scare you. But then, then two minutes later, you're laughing, you know. And for me, that's oh, that's it's it's the best the best of both worlds. I see. Uh, horror films as kind of like amusement rides, you know, different types of amusement rides. But the best horror films are the ones that just go up and down. It's just like a, a roller coaster, like, you know, Evil Dead 2 is an uh, is a incredibly funny film. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 is an incredibly funny film. The Bride of Frankenstein is an incredibly funny film. I mean, there are a lot of great, great films out there that just they just uh, are, are kind of like a, a, just a rocking boat ride as you're, you're like this. But I mean, to, to really answer your question, when I saw my, my first horror movie, Day of the Triffids, I was, again, just mesmerized by the intensity of the film, uh, the, the drama of it, and my mind clicking going, oh, this is different from all those Disney films that I have been seeing. You know, all, all, these, all this Walt Disney stuff that, you know, that my parents were pushing on me. And, and from that moment on, I, I, I sought out other horror films. And literally, like a year later, the, uh, the, the wave of, uh, of horror hosts appeared all, all over syndicated television all throughout, all throughout the states, and they would, you know, these TV stations would play these old horror films, and they'd have a horror host who'd come on and and host uh, the um, the film. You know, like um, a good ex modern example would be uh, Elvira. Um, but you know, the, people have been doing this stuff since the 50s. Anyway, there's a a, a a horror show that came on, and I was glued to it every Saturday, 9 p.m. Me and my, my friends, we just, we lived by that stuff. And, and um, I'm still waiting for, for it to fade away, and it hasn't. And there's a lot of great horror films that I still need to see yeah, yeah. right now. Okay, right. well, there's time. Yeah. I think there's some pretty good cable in your hotel room, probably. Yep, yep. <laughs> so tell us a bit about Frank Frazetta and Basil Gogos. You've some wonderful original art in this exhibition by these two artists. And uh, you've met them both, right? And so, you know, they're not poster artists, but they did covers for magazines that you collected. You started out with Creepy and famous Monsters of Filmdoms. So how do you perceive them fitting into your collection overall? Well, well, Frank Frazetta, for one, I mean, he was responsible for a lot of really, really great, great uh, magazine covers for Creepy magazine, Eerie magazine, and he did a lot of uh, stuff for, for uh, a lot of big uh, publishing houses. He did a lot of paperback covers. And there was a time in the 70s where it's just, as a kid, it's almost everywhere I looked, you know, I'd see Frank Vizetta poster, or book cover, or, you know, whatever, calendar. And, um, and it, it, 
it, it was his artwork just it was just so haunting and and anyone who's familiar with his work will just will will just will know that when you first see Frank Frazetta's stuff it it, it looks otherworldly it, it 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 looks familiar but it it's not familiar and you know the 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 women look otherworldly and, and just voluptuous but but not it's just like you know all, all the uh, all the men look really just like muscular but just like unrealistic unreal, it, it's it's really it's he puts he puts my mind into this other world where it's everything is just Frank Frazetta world and it really feels like he's not really not really painting a portrait, but kind of like op opening a portal to this world where everything looks like that. I mean, it's r his 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 artwork is so stylized to me that it just it seems like a whole another universe. It's like an for, from a museum standpoint, I can say it's like an alternate art history. It's like he doesn't fit into the model at all, but he's got his devotees for sure. Basil Gogos. Yeah, Basil Gogos was a, a, another artist who's just his whole take on 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 portraits, and that's what he did. He he did portraits of, of all, all these of these horror characters and all these monsters. His whole take was because he was just working from black and white stills. Was he would imagine what it would be like with three colored lights shined on these characters, and he would paint that. He would take a black and white picture and just imagine in his mind and then paint it that way. And I just thought that, wow, that's just such an amazing way to approach things. And it, it brought out such an amazing effect. Again, you were seeing these, po these, 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 these personalities that you would associate with in black and white, all of a sudden in full color and raging psychedelic color. I mean, not just like, you know, colorized, but in, in the late 60s and 70s, when the hippie thing was going full swing, the, there, there's full on psychedelic renditions of a lot of these, these, these monsters. I love the fact that you've taken those paintings and you've put them in fancy gold frames as yes. if they're ancient yeah. European master exactly. works. It's yeah, just exactly. amazing. Yeah. Renaissance. But I, but I also uh, know that you are pretty well versed in the fine arts, the more traditional fine arts, shall we say, as well. Um, do you care to talk about some artists that jazz you or something wonderful you've seen here in your short stay at, at well, ROM? I, mean, I have to say, I mean, when, right when I walked in, I saw those two giant totems. Did you guys see that on left and right? Are they this way? This way? They're um, amazing. I, you know, I I'd seen totems, uh, totem poles up in, in in Alaska, but those are the biggest ones I've ever seen, and I was just kind of blown away by that. I mean, I intend to do a, a walk around, um, but yeah, those totems are just completely breathtaking. I was just in Florence, uh, yeah. and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of, there. yeah. a lot of museums there. Do they know who Frank Frazetta is in Florence? Pardon? Do they know who Frank Frazetta is? You know, in I was, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I wish I could just brag to the, 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 those people. Hey, I, I got a couple Frazettas, but they're just like, you know, whatever. But you know, I was, um, I, I was at uh, one museum, and um, it's the one with the Italian name that I can't pronounce. And I went there just to see the one, this one painting, and, and, and I, you might be familiar with it. It's a, of a shield with the Gorgon on it. Mm -hmm. It's a you know, classical painting from, I don't know, like 6th, 17th century. That museum was huge, and I looked for it forever and ever, and I found it after 45 minutes, and I was so happy to find it. You did find it, good. Yeah, yeah. I did find it. Did you happen to walk by a woman on a shell rising up out yeah, of the Yeah, that ocean one's easy to, time? okay. Yeah, just that one's it. easy to find. Just check yeah, it. Yeah, that one, that, it's just, yeah. You know, I appreciate uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Baroque European art, but after like 450, <laughs> Sightings, yeah, it's it gets it's hard. It's a big museum. I didn't I didn't start I didn't study that period of art. So. Okay, got it. Yeah. 
So let's get back to some of the true classics, some of those films that you're so interested in, because at the core really is, um, you know, Frankenstein, The Mummy, and Dracula, but those sort of come out of the earliest um, films, which are sort of those classic uh, stories, so these early romantic stories, you know, Edgar Allan Poe and Victor Hugo, and these things still resonate with people today. Um, I think that's really fascinating. Um, is it the complexity? Tell me what you think. Why would people watch a 1930s film, Victor Hugo, rather than um, what you know is being put out today? You know, I think that's a really, really interesting question. I mean, uh, I, the way I see these 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 movies. Uh, the Mummy, Frankenstein, Dracula. You know, I, I think that 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 even though that they have their origins in in in, in European culture, you know, I, I truly think that 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 these are you know, America's um, fairy tales. You know, they're like our our grim fairy tales, or you know, it, it, they're kind of like our our fables. Uh, you know, we're. I, I truly believe that, that they're they're you know products of of American culture you know twentieth century American culture and you know I I truly believe that we can own these as like our own real fairy tales I mean really really important and uh, and you know for me I mean it's it's kind of important to to recognize that and um, these stories I mean Dracula the Mummy Frankenstein. I, they're actually really, really great, great stories. I mean, they they follow the human condition, and 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 you know these characters they go through a whole range of emotions that that, that you know people experience every day. Uh, and I mean, I for me as as a child watching this stuff, I mean, it really, really hit me on an emotional level, you know, because I I I, I felt a, a, a bit. Like I was an outsider and an outcast when I was younger, and I can relate to these these, these monsters, you know, who, who had trouble fitting in. You know, they wanted the girl, but you know, there's no way they're gonna get them, you know. And, and you know, I just and they just wanted to have friends, but you know, they got chased up the hill, and you know, you, you ended up with a pretty good one, by the way. You know, so you can't relate too closely to the monsters. I'm sorry, say that again. You ended up pretty, with a pretty good woman, by the way, so you can't relate too, too closely to those monsters. Uh, but I'd, you know, let's take a look at this poster here. What I'd like to um, inspire people here uh, to go up into the galleries and undertake some really close looking. Uh, some, instead of just walking by and saying, wow, and moving on to the next one, if you stop and you look at a poster for a while, you see lots of things that you didn't otherwise, you wouldn't otherwise notice. And a lot of these posters really warrant that kind of close looking. So you've spoken a lot about this poster, as so many of them, and given me so many insights. Just look at this poster for a while and tell me what it is you like about it. Well, I, I just, uh, you know, I, it's amazing because when it came up on the screen, I just realized something else about this poster that I never really realized before. Um, and I'll, I'll share that with you, but um, okay. So you need, you know the eyes; they're kind of just floating down. Um, okay, so behind uh, the Dracula lettering, it, I, I always thought it looked like a silhouette of a head. You know how you, how you see it, and I think maybe what the artist thought or, or was trying to do was to, to make the silhouette of the head and the eyes maybe, maybe to like use it to convey a, a kind of like looking down and coming at, at, at its victim, the woman. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of what I, you know, just got just from looking at it just right now. But I mean, in general, when, when I see this poster, it's really amazing because it's, it's so, again, sexually suggestive. And I can't help it. When I see those eyes, I think of, I think of, Women's breasts. I can't help it. <laughs> I'm completely honest. I mean, I I'm sure it's pure coincidence. It's like, it, wow. It's just, yeah. To this day, I mean, maybe, maybe. I, ever, I have. That's not why I have had this poster on not. a guitar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and on, so, the, on my guitar, the eyes light up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a poster everyone's looking at now. What is the image? And I didn't mean it that way, but that's even better. Um, what do you like about some of the imagery in a poster or two upstairs that people have to go look for on their own right now? Is there something that you think is a particularly novel thing? Well, I mean, uh, uh, okay, so uh, uh, one, uh, one theme that, that runs through a lot of the, these posters is that they, uh, a lot of these movies were made in the 20s and 30s, and so there's a real distinct art deco theme that, that runs through a lot of them. And you know that's something that's just kind of really kind of like fun and cool and easy to like spot you know from poster to poster, but you know the vibrance of, the vibrance of every poster is different. You know uh, every poster has a, a kind of like a different illumination coming off of it. Some posters are darker than other posters. Some posters are brighter. You know, it's maybe just my my perception of it, but you know, some just like really jump out and scream at you, but some just kind of like, you know, re really draw you in and just kind of invite you in, in into the poster. So, and some of them just have Amazing little silly anecdotes that you have to know the inside track on to, to yeah. I mean, to appreciate. Uh, uh, well, a, a lot of the posters, uh, like in, in the in the 50s, amazingly enough, were, were designed first, and then the movie was made afterwards. I mean, if you can believe that, like a good example is Invasion of the Saucerman. They designed the the poster first and the concept first, and then they made the movie, which is like totally backwards. I mean, it's like <laughs> designing a can and, and then filling it with whatever it's designed for. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> so, so tell us about The Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah well, do, we, do we have a... a, a no, we don't. Oh, we don't. They have to go look okay, at so, for it later so, on. Okay, so I, earlier I was talking about how, how the, the, a lot of these illustrators would be on set kind of observing everything and uh, taking notes. And I think for, for, for whoever the illustrator was on this set of Bride of Frankenstein, there's a poster upstairs mm -hmm. and uh, there's a, a picture of Elsa Lanchester drinking tea and it's on the poster, and it's it's well known that 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 the, when she was that that particular image of her drinking tea was taken by a photographer during a break in between scenes, and you can see her without her wig, and she's like laying like you know laying all down all wrapped up all wrapped up, and she has like her cup of tea. And you know, it's not a scene from the movie, but it's on the movie poster. It's on, at the, on the bottom of the movie poster. And it, it's hilarious, because the, the illustrator must have seen that and said, no, oh, okay, I'm gonna draw that and put that on the poster. No one ever told him that that wasn't a scene in the movie. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And nobody questioned it, because no one she questioned looks like it she's either. writhing. It and, made it and, through production, you know, it was just like. Wow. <laughs> so let's look at another. So I was really impressed when you uh, pointed out to me the, the scene uh, that this whole poster is, uh, that generated uh, th this scene in the poster. You've obviously watched a lot of these films very, very closely. Yeah. Yeah, um, that scene doesn't really, really exist in, uh, in the film. A, a version of it is, is close, but it doesn't really exist. But it, it's 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 close enough, and it's super provo provocative. What's really amazing about this poster is that um, James Whale, who, who who directed Frankenstein, was not the original director. It was a a, a man named Robert Flory who who was assigned on to direct Frankenstein, and this particular poster has both directors on, on it, both Robert Flory and James Whale. And, and, and that's what makes this, one of, the, one of the things that makes this poster, for me, particularly interesting is that they actually credited both directors. Robert Flory had a lot to do with, with the movie, but he never w was, was credited on, on any of the American posters. On this 
particular poster, this French poster, he actually got a credit, which I thought was really, really cool. Isn't this poster unique? Is there another? Yeah, there, there's a, it's, a, it's the only one that, that they exist. Like a lot of the posters you'll see, like the Nosferatu poster, that's only it's the only one known to exist. This poster is the only one known to exist. There's a number of them upstairs that are just one of a kind pieces and belong in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> what luck. Yeah, so um, I thought I had known Frankenstein before I saw this poster and I looked at it and thought, that's an odd scene. I, I don't remember that scene. Yeah, it's, it, it's kind of a, uh, it's like someone like saw the movie and then thought, hmm, what was that scene like? I can't really remember. I think it went like this. That's what that, <laughs> but you know, it captures the essence of the movie. Oh yeah, yeah. no doubt. I mean, no doubt. it really does. So let's talk about a couple of your newest additions to your collection, which I'm pretty impressed are upstairs. Um, Yes. I love the crazy crayon strokes that, that lithographic pencil behind and around Dracula's head there. Yes. Uh, that is quite an amazing lithograph. Yeah. Uh, today was the first time I'd, I'd actually seen this poster in person. I had just acquired it last year, and, um, and, and so I was very happy to see it. And yes, there, you know, there, there there are marks behind his head that I'd never seen before that kind of give it kind of like a, a motion, like he's kind of like almost flying through the air. And uh, it's, it was, I was really surprised to see that because, you know, again, I've never actually had the opportunity to get really up close to this poster. This poster is one of two known to exist. This particular poster was discovered only last year. Um, it was owned by a person who collected movie posters before anyone collected movie posters, which is amazing. <laughs> and um, and I, I guess um, their, uh, their descendants or wh whoever acquired this poster and saw it and thought, oh, wow, this is important. And that's how I acquired well, it. The richness of color is really astounding. Pardon? The richness of color is yeah, really astounding. It's, it's, a, it's amazing because it's, a, it's in really, really great condition. Um, you know, the, the first colors to go when a movie poster is seeing too much light or, or too much sunlight or too, too much UV light, the first colors to go are the, usually the yellows, yellows and the oranges. With this particular poster, the yellow is just like, it looks so, so rich, I mean, this poster has been well stored and has not seen very much light at all. So um, you must be a fan of things flying through the air because of the one next to it <laughs> yeah. there. The yeah. Original art yeah. for Invasion of the Saucerman. Yep. Okay, so what yeah, find. Invasion of the Saucerman. This is this is the artwork one one of the uh, one of the posters that was designed b before the movie was actually made, and you know. I can see, I mean, look, by looking at this art, that, you know, there's a, there's, there's a, 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 there's a lot of, um, a lot of inspiration to write a story or, you know, by looking at this painting. Um, this movie, if you've ever seen it, it's a really fun movie if you're, you're like 10 years old. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's, uh, and, and you know, it's entertaining now if, if you watch it and pretend you're 10 years old. <laughs> um, but you know, for me, it's always had a, a, a you know, a special place because I, lo I love, I love the, the way the aliens look. They're like sort of little green men with big heads, just like you would think little green men would look. And uh, this original art, it's ama amazing because original movie poster art is really, really rare and hard to find, and examples of it, of it are just, they just don't come up. This this piece was found in uh, an antique store in Florida, of all places, last year, and I think the person who who got it paid they, like maybe two dollars for it, and. Uh, realized what they had and so and put it in an auction house and and now it's here 
for everyone else to see. So the original art, I mean, from the 50s, that's really in the grand scheme of things not that long ago. Why do you think that more of this stuff was not preserved? Why is it not out there? You know, I, I really don't know. I mean, I mean it, there could be any, any, any sort of answer for that, but it, it seems like the appreciation for this kind of stuff just wasn't there. And, and people didn't, didn't consider that maybe in the future it might be important to someone, someone like me. Yeah, it's just a part of a process of something that they weren't quite done yet. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean it, when you think about it, it really is an abstract notion. It's like me like picking this up and saying, this is going to be worth something in like 75 years. But right now, it's not worth anything. I mean, be careful with it. <laughs> you know, but I mean, really, that's when you really think about it. I mean, collecting. I mean, th things need time to 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 to, to, to like uh, gain value. It seems like. I mean, no one thought about keeping movie posters, they were just taken for granted. That's why there's, there's hardly any of them left. That's why there's only two of the, these Dracula posters. I mean, people just t took it for granted and didn't really think that they'd be things of value or would be important to anyone in the future. So, in the past you've said uh, that you're kind of a shy person and you're a private person. I appreciate, I'm sure everyone appreciates you exposing your inner thoughts and some of your personal um, collecting activities with all of us here, yet you clearly have no trouble stepping out in front of an audience of 60,000 people and, and doing your thing. I mean, tonight's a piece of cake, there's only 600 people here, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, is doing something like that, does that give you a similar emotional charge as watching a film or looking at your collection? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm such a creature of habit, I will only do things that, 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 that I, I know will have a certain outcome, <laughs> like everyone else. Um, but I mean, you know, getting lost in a horror movie is, is not that far away from me getting lost in my guitar playing. And you know, when I'm out, and when I'm playing, uh, playing it with the band and I'm, I, I'm concentrating, on, on playing my instrument and interacting with the band, a lot of things in my life just disappear. And a lot of times, I mean, don't take this personally, but sometimes the audience even disappears and I'm just, it's just so much in the process. And, and it's, it's similar to like, you know, being lost in a, a really great book or a really great movie. I mean, it, it, it takes me someplace where I, I wanna be, you know, I feel safe and I feel inspired. So there's a strong relationship in the emotional charge and in what you seek yeah. in your life. Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I seek congruency in, in, in the things that, that, that I'm curious about. And, 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 and you know, and, and I, I really love, even, even though it, you know, I, I am shy and, and I, I, I'm, I'm creature of habit, I love the unpredictability of music, I love the unpredictability of the horror genre. You know, in other uh, parts of my life, I love that, like the unpredictability of like surfing or or the unpredictability of improvising. You know, playing my instrument. Um, but it's almost like you know, organized unpredictability. It's unpredictability within a c confine, and you know. That's why I like horror. It's, uh, it's unpredictable, but I know what type of unpredictable. Yet, uh, you have worked on a piece of music that uh, is specifically designed sort of as an expression of how these films and these posters make you feel. I mean, it's a fantastic piece, um, and, and not at all the sound people would expect to come from you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. Um, I, well, okay, so I wrote, along with with my wife, Lonnie, wrote a, a piece of music called The Maiden and the Monster for, for, the, uh, for the, the Peabody Essex show. And it's a piece that, that tells a story uh, um, uh, um, 
in audio terms, and it kind of unfolds like a, like a film would it un unfold, and it's meant to be played while you're observing everything uh, in, in the show. And uh, for this show, I composed another piece of music, and uh, I wrote it with, with my wife, so I'm at the mercy of, a, of, a, of, a, of her whims. <laughs> she just sh signed off on it today. Uh, yeah. We were supposed to have it done last week, uh, but uh, it will come to, to the museum, and, we'll, and uh, at some point it will be available for people to hear. Uh, it's the second piece of music. It, it's instrumental as well as the first, and it's called The Djinn. And um, the Djinn is a, 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 a Middle Eastern term for genie. And uh, uh, again, it's an audio, kind of an audio story that unfolds. And, um, and the title, The Djinn, hopefully will just kind of set the mood for, for, for uh, how you experience the music because uh, it, it, it tells a story of the djinn. Hmm. So that's a new creative direction for you. So today is somewhat of a sort of a culminating moment for you in a way you, you know, it, it's a crescendo if I may borrow a musical kind of term. Um, so you have a show, you have a new book and something that shows off like at least 30 years of your collecting activities, right? So now you're where are your interest as a collector heading next, if you care to divulge? Um, are there facets that you want to explore that you haven't yet? Uh, are there new directions that you want to go, like such as this, this musical piece, for instance? Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm getting more and, and more into classical music, classical composers, and, uh, and, and a lot of classical composers take on, on, on the horror genre. There's a, quite a few composers who, who who were like the first soundtrack music, sound, wrote the first soundtrack music. I mean, really, I mean, uh, Modest Mussorgsky wrote Night on Bald Mountain. And if, if anyone who knows that, that piece, Night on Bald Mountain, that's like, that's, it, it's, it's a soundtrack to, to the, any horror movie that was made in the 20s or 30s. I mean, and so, I want to go into that direction, really. I mean, I want to, I want to start orchestrating music, uh, and and telling musical stories through through music in much the same way as a lot of these classical guys, classical guys did in the nineteenth century and twentieth century. I mean, that's a, a a real, real curiosity of mine, and it comes at a good time because in September. We're going to be playing two shows with the San Francisco Symphony, and I'm going to be um, 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 uh, immersed in all sorts of uh, of uh, classical music and classical musicians, and it's going to be great. Fantastic. Well, maybe you can inspire them to play Swan Lake because I do know yeah. that. Yeah. Since you pointed that out, Swan Lake is in, in like almost every every uh, 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 horror movie in, in 1931, 1932, 1933. There you'll you'll hear Swan Lake in either the beginning of the movie or at the end of the movie. <laughs> and it's once crazy. you've heard it, now you'll notice it every time. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Yeah. Well, look, I know that you have the stamina to go do this for another two hours because that's just what you do. Um, but I know the museum has a schedule to keep. So uh, on behalf of all of us, if you have any parting words for us, fabulous. But we all uh, I would like to thank you for the time that you've given us today. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, thank you again for, for coming here and, 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 and giving me the opportunity to show my wondrous collection to you guys. I, I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I do. Um, I'm in love with my collection. I hope you guys love it as much as I do. And <laughs> as much joy from it. Thanks. <laughs>